Welcome to another Coffee with Sanso, where we speak with um, ASX companies about the stories uh, and the guys who are sort of running the companies, uh, sharing the, their thoughts and where things are going. Uh, we're here at the UWA Club in uh, Crawley at the University of Western Australia. And today we're here with um, James Hill from Singular Health, uh, whose code is SHG. Uh, James is the Chief Operating Officer uh, um, James is new to Coffee with Sanso, but Singular Health is not. Um, look, James, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, James, look, you know, you guys have been uh, a newly listed um, IPO beginning of this year, I believe, January, I think. Uh, that's correct. We yeah. did our IPO during January, uh, and we actually had the IPO date on the 12th of Feb uh, okay. this year. Yep. yep. Look, James, you know, things have moved on. We had a, a Coffee Sanso. Uh, sort of introducing, I think this was done pre-IPO, but um, down the road, things have moved. Um, so give us an update of what's been happening. Yeah, they've, they've sure moved. I mean, um, Coffee with Sam's, I think was like December last year, yeah. um, pre-IPO. Um, since then, you know, it's just been a, a crazy year. I'm sure it's been a crazy year for everyone, but uh, it seems like the whole year's flown by since we, we listed back in February. Um We've seen the company kind of go from strength to strength. We moved office, uh, we've, you know, um, drawn out the team. Um, but most importantly, we've kind of taken the opportunity to really refine the direction that the company's going in. So still in line with everything that we, we said in the, in the prospectus uh, in terms of the areas that we're focusing on, um, but we've refined the kind of go-to-market strategy and how we plan on scaling the company once the borders open and, and once we can actually start to uh, travel and market the company uh, heavily again. Uh, so it's really been a, a period of kind of um, setting foundations and, and really building out the technology um, so that we can scale it en masse globally um, while still leveraging all of the great you know, virtual reality um, technology that we have and the, the access to, to surgeons and various areas. Um, just so an update uh, viewers, I guess, you know, Singular Health, you came onto the market as, um, correct me if I'm wrong, yep. with, with some action, um, a virtual reality software that will help um, people view their scans and things like that. And like everything else, I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not special in the sense that you're, you're refining your, your business as everybody does, yep. um, which is what you were saying before. Um, so now you've gone to, um, I see from your announcements, you know, when we say a big change, I think it's, it's, a, it's a vertical integration kind of process, right? Can yep. you just run us through that? Yeah, so what we did was um, kind of at the time of the prospectus last year, um, we were already in the midst of making these changes. So uh, as you, you rightly pointed out, we went to the market with what we called MedVR. So this was a piece of software conceptualized locally in 2017 and brought to um, fruition um, you know, through Singular Health. And effectively, when you have a CT or an MRI or a PET scan, so these kind of common radiological images, it creates a 3D view. So these are all captured in 2D planes, so individual slices that go through, and it would create a 3D model. You could then put a virtual reality headset on and walk around inside the model. Now, before the um, we went to market, we were already in the midst of changing this because with uh, COVID coming about, what we were doing with the VR is we were using like a wired headset. So it had to connect to a gaming computer and you'd put this wired headset on and you'd get this great, you know, immersive view. You'd basically be walking through the patient looking inside their lungs and you can travel down the airways and you know, get this massive um, impression, you know, this, this brilliant impression of, of patient-specific anatomy. But given that it was hardware and it was wired, the logistical challenges posed by COVID, um, but also just posed by, by scaling it, you know, the, the capital expenditure, uh, expenditure required by customers, we really wanted to get that down. And so cat, uh, COVID was the catalyst but it wasn't the kind of primary driver. So to scale the business, we realized that we really wanted to move it to a software only um, application. So just prior to the prospectus, we we're all kind of working on bringing this crossover onto desktop. 
um, and moving it on to things like this, a standalone virtual reality headset. So this here, no wires, um, but and you know, brilliant hardware, but you still require the software to be optimized such that it can work on this. And now, you know, with the whole um, advent of the metaverse, you know, there is vertical integration possible there. But what we did once we moved it to a desktop version is you can go onto the internet and you can literally download the software. So we're still waiting on regulatory approvals, but as a scientific and research tool at the moment, uh, you can download the software from anywhere in the world. And this allows us to use Google Ads, it allows us to change it to a kind of direct to pr uh, practitioner and direct to customer um, marketing model. Um, but it also allowed us to do really interesting things. So start to bring in artificial intelligence, uh, start to bring in what we call virtual surgical planning, uh, which operates on this Quest 2. Um, and then vertically integrate that all the way through into 3D printing. Um, and there were a couple of kind of key transactions that happened just after the IPO, uh, which really accelerated that scan to surgery process that we're deploying. So that's um, advanced version of version one. Is that basically? Correct, it's taken MedVR and made it completely wireless. These can be bought off of Amazon for like $490, $500. Um, and you know Amazon's worldwide. The software can be downloaded anywhere around the world. It makes this instantly scalable. You know you can the cut the surgeons themselves, provided there's regulatory approval in that area, say Europe, um, with the MDR regulations or the uh, US with FDA, we can get them to order the headset themselves. It's an off-the-shelf piece of of hardware, um, and then they just download our software and they've got you know patient specific models available in, in virtual reality. So it's really targeting for the surgeons to use in initially or purposely? Um, yeah, so to um, put in kind of perspective and, and the direction that the company's taking is that we're focusing on both um, surgical applications and also patient education as well. So there's kind of two areas that the company focuses on. With the patient engagement, we've gone down the, the path of, you know, along with optimizing it for the virtual reality headset, we've now optimized it for smartphones. So all of the rendering, the MedVR rendering platform that we had, the volumetric rendering platform, it works on a smartphone. And that allows you to, you know, pull up the mobile app, um, get your own patient images and actually view it in 3D and turn around. So that's great for the patient. There's very limited functionality there because you don't want to overwhelm the patient or give them access to surgical tools um, when they need to be used by a, a trained practitioner. Scan to surgery is, is a really interesting area in terms of the surgical applications. So where we're targeting surgeons, it's really in the process of um, advanced uh, surgical procedures. So you're not going to use our software to, you know, treat tonsillitis where you can easily see it with existing hardware and, and it's a really standard procedure. Where you've got, um, you know, cranial implants, where you've got, you know, hip replacements, shoulder replacements, spinal surgery, all of that complex surgery that varies from patient to patient and requires you to actually, you know, open up the patient to do it. That's where we really come to the fore. And scan to surgery doesn't just allow for the visualization of the patient, but it actually allows for patient specific implants to be created, um, artificial intelligence to kind of triage or bring to the attention of the radiologist or the practitioner what the issue is, or do things like segmentation. So um, the sequence of scan to surgery is that a scan is taken, a CT, an MRI or a PET scan is taken of the patient. It's then transferred from the scanning device, uh, which is just standard hardware, you know, sta existing hardware. There's no required changes to the, the scanners in the hospital uh, or the you know, radiological clinic. It then goes into what's called a PAC system, so a picture archiving and communication system. This stores the images. So this is like, again, existing hardware that we're gonna leverage 
um, existing infrastructure. So the practitioner, the surgeon, can then retrieve the images from that um, storage space and they can view the, the, um, the scan in 3D or virtual reality using our 3DICOM software. Um, in the 3DICOM uh, surgical version of the software, uh, we'll be implementing or integrating some artificial intelligence models. Um, and that will do things like our Kickstart 1 program with CSIRO. It'll actually extract all of the vertebrae automatically, something that would take like four hours to do manually. It's going through finding all of the vertebrae and actually creating computer-aided design files. So this is your IP, right? Yeah, this is um, the IP. Like We've developed this entire platform that can integrate these um, you know, AI models. And then once you've got done, use the AI model to accelerate the process, it then goes into virtual surgical planning. So when you've converted a radiological image into a computer-aided design file, you can put this virtual reality headset on or you can use our desktop software and you can actually manipulate the, the anatomy. So you've got the base anatomy of the patient here, but if they wanted to cut the maxilla here and move it forward, they can do that or they will be able to do that in our software um, to yeah cut through the anatomy there and say, I want to move this forward four millimetres. And this is you know, pre-surgical planning. You don't even have to cut the patient forward. You're using a digital twin mm -hmm. of the patient's anatomy. Planning your surgery there, making all of the movements. And then once you've done that in what we call virtual surgical planning, you can then export it to a 3D printer. And for this reason, we've made an investment in a 3D print facility in Melbourne, uh, which was announced in March of this year. Uh, and kind of ratified in a EGM in May. Um, and that will 3D print not just the biomodels, not just the, you know, um, manipulated patient anatomy in its, you know, kind of before and after modes, but it will also generate the cutting guides and the drill guides that go in to show the surgeon where to move it forward and even the implants that will then hold it in its final position. So it's all about patient-specific implants. It's all about patient-specific medicine um, that is tailored to the, the patient's own anatomy. And so this process, we want to, it's a complete vertical integration. We always display it in a horizontal yeah. flow because it's kind of a workflow yeah. that goes through a sequence of events. But it's, it's very much a vertical integration because the output of the you know 3D scan feeds into the AI. The AI feeds into the virtual surgical planning, which again, we acquired earlier this year, some software that we've been integrating into our free DICOM um, software. Uh, and then when you then have that VSP and you can export to 3D print, um, we've made that investment so that we're also capturing the value when we're you know, printing these biomodels. Um, located in Melbourne, that 3D print facility uh, called Australian um, Additive Engineering or AAE uh, that you know will make turnaround times a lot quicker. Uh, it will provide local manufacturing or you know sovereign capability here in Australia, um, which means that we can reduce our reliance on you know offshore manufacturing of, of 3D printed patient components, and it also just makes the turnaround time a lot faster. You're shipping it from your making it in Melbourne, you're shipping it to Sydney, you're not making it in Belgium or Israel or South Korea and shipping it to Sydney. What stage are you guys at? Because I'm here sitting here listening, you think, you know, precision and all this and, and you know, being not from the medical field, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, how precise, precise are you, right? I mean, I didn't want it to be up by a mil, right? Yeah. So, yes, so where, how do we visualize or understand precision in that sense. Yep. So that, that's what we have in the virtual surgical planning. So when you're making this manipulation, it is going down to, you know, tenths of millimeters, etc. cetera. Um, obviously all of this has to be validated by a surgeon um, and our software still, before we can commercialize the kind of virtual surgical planning aspect of it, 
um, for everyday use rather than like research use, um, that will require regulatory approval. So the, the, the big focus in the company at the moment is on regulatory approvals, um, but really there's not much point spending a lot of uh, money in the company on, on getting regulatory approvals if you, you haven't you know, got your software you know, 90% of the way there. So we've made a big investment in the, the software this year um, in creating all of this foundational, um, these foundational aspects and, and getting the, the workflows right and the mobile you know, optimization so it works standalone, correct? Um, and now it's you know, moving towards this regulatory path. And that's not something that ever kind of changes yeah. Um, in the medical space, it's it's just part and parcel of being involved in the medical industry is that you have to, you know, have everything regulated. It hasn't stopped us from commercialising the technology, the, both the core technology and some of our spin-offs or derivatives of this volumetric rendering platform. So we're still able to commercialise it as a research and scientific tool. Um, we, you know run a lot of disclaimers in the software as well, um, mm -hmm. letting people know that they can't, you know, at, at the moment use it for medical um, purposes or preoperative planning. Um, but it's certainly the space that we're moving into and the software now is, you know, it is capable of, you know, segmenting out the patient's anatomy, converting it into a 3D print file like this and then actually 3D printing it um, and this is about a 75% scale skull. Um, using some uh, advanced algorithms and you know AI, we've been able to like extract this skull from the actual patient's anatomy in about five minutes. Okay. So it's really about you know accelerating these patient-specific implants. There's a massive market available, um, but in the interim we have been you know, starting to commercialise the technology um, and that's also come about in kind of our derivative product uh, which is the GeoVR <laughs> technology as well. So, in the in the sense, you, you're effectively at the pilot stage, right? You, you're sort of proving, is, 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 do I take that proof of concepts pass, now it's more proof of reliability. Would that be a fair comment? That, that's correct. I yeah. mean, to if you want to put it in mining terms, we've proven off the resource. Yeah. Um, now, you know, it's all about doing kind of like the, you know, um, definitive, you know, the bankable feasibility study. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's proven to be, you know, feasible. We're in a market where you can command really high prices. Um, we're very passionate about making the software accessible. Um, the software has been translated into multiple different languages. Um, and we can add additional languages with quite a lot of ease um, as well. Um, and th the market is huge. You know, there, there are 1.1 million cranial implant or you know, craniotomies or cranial surgeries per year um, globally. The US alone does around 650,000 knee replacements a year, 350,000 hip replacements per year. Patient specific implants is in the cutting guides, patient specific components that's accounting for around like five to ten percent of the market at the moment but it's growing at a you know really rapid pace people are seeing the benefits of these patient specific implants as 3d printing technology you know metal 3d printing becomes more commonplace and cheaper it's also bringing this into the realm of possibility for you know less bespoke cases um, and we only see it as being a you know, a growing market, not just in the US, but globally, where patients uh, specific implants and personalized medicine is really the next, you know, hot sector or trend. Um, and I think we're really well aligned in terms of our development pathway, our regulatory pathway, to time that with, you know, the rise of the metaverse, the rise of these, you know, um, patient specific surgeries. I think software is the key. I think that that is your business, right? And and I think you know someone sitting in Australia or Belgium or wherever can actually send that to a 3D printer wherever and have that printed out. Correct, that's yeah. that's simple, right? Yeah. It's in, and and I guess regulatory is what awaits you guys 
um, I, I remember it's it's like you know this thing works, but you're just waiting for them to give you those three ticks. Correct. And then, then you, s- you know, the the world is your oyster. I mean, being being patient specific is very important. I think, um, because no one person is the same, no one injury is the same. It it's almost an impossibility to redo an injury. Um, and yeah, that I think that the where where you sit, you know, the time difference between. You scan this thing and being able to print that out is um, not common thing currently. Would that is that that's correct? Yeah. yeah, and and a lot of the time, it's being taken out of the hands of the surgeon, and you know handled by multinational companies who you once they've got hold of the scan, they'll get a little bit of input from the surgeon, but they're not really involving the surgeon or this is the feedback that we've had then they're not really involving the surgeon so much in the preparation of the case so the surgeon's beholden to fitting their schedule with the multinational you know Mm. um design company to schedule in a design session go through and actually just ratify the changes as opposed to being able to kind of do most of the planning themselves, get it checked off by a bioengineer, get it checked off by the 3D printing facility, and then actually proceed. So we're all about you know reducing that time from the initial scan through to the final surgery, um, and you know providing surgeons more input and providing patients a bit more um, you know understanding of their case as well, because they can look at the pre and post planned you know virtual surgical plan. Mm. It reduces anxiety in, in, you know, there's been a number of papers that have shown it's reduced anxiety. Um, doing preoperative planning and involving the patient reduces blood loss. Um, there's less adrenaline. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's something that we're very passionate about in the, in the company. I think, you know, from the ground up, um, we really, you know, feel passionate about creating this software. And, and with the regulatory pathway, the good thing about software is that we're getting the software approved. We're not creating a range of medical products that are, sp- um, you know, that need each of them to have clinical trials or to mm. be, re- uh, you know, to be approved. We're creating software which can be done, you know, quite. You know, you're getting the software regulated. And then the bespoke surgical implants that come out of it obviously need to comply with a, a quality management system and, and be checked, mm. etc. But we're not, you know, applying for every single you know three D print that comes out of it. I think as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, that not not wanting to trivialise the, um, the the business. It's almost as if like you you got a, you got a, an assembly of cars and they're all cutting the same thing. And they're all cut into a specific size and shape, and all run by software, right? Effectively, there's a guy sitting in a room, puts the design in, sets the machine go, and bang, 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 he cuts it out. Yeah. That that's, in a nutshell, what your software is allowing people to do, right? It's, it's, that's it's correct. Go from yeah. Existing scanning converts into a 3D model or 3D shape, allowing visualization. And as you were talking, you know, um, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, taking the, the Dr. Google out of the picture. Yeah. Whereas people can actually visualize and, and lower the anxieties and things like that. Um, so that is the software, isn't it? It is basically that simple. That's correct. And, and you don't have to use every single step of the scan to surgery process. For example, when we talk about patient anxiety, you can go through from the scan, the packs, pull the the file down, retrieve the file from the the hospital server, show it in 3D, and then you'll be able to share it with the patient with some annotations on there and remove Dr. Google. Because if you can record your session with a patient with a 3D model that the patient understands, because the patients haven't gone to med school, they they don't understand these 2D slices, they have have no idea. (laughs) Everyone's talking, they're an expert now, right? Yeah. (laughs) Depends uh, on which topic. But yeah, yeah, I mean, with the access to, to Google and the ability for um, patients to go and, you know, look up, you know, yeah, specific yeah. things, it's very easy to fall into that Dr. Google trap. Yeah. But yeah. if you've got a mobile app that shows your body or your anatomy in 3D, 
it's got little annotations or labels in there. It's got, you know, even maybe potentially a video of your consult with the doctor. Yeah. You're more likely to go look at that. Yeah. And then you're relying on the doctor's feedback. You can pull it up at any point in time. I don't know how many times, you know, gone to the doctor or family members gone to the doctor. They come back from their consult and you go, so how to go with the doctor? And you get basically <laughs> a five word summary. Yeah. And it's, it's missing some of those pertinent points or, you know, yeah. what, you know, the side effects might be or, you know, why the doctor recommends holding off on a particular treatment. So that's what we're trying to solve with the patient app. Yeah. And that really is only, you know, using the scan and the AI components or stages of the scan to surgery process, but you're still getting a huge amount of value out of it. So it's a quite ubiquitous piece of software, like it's a platform that can be built on um, in each of these different steps. Mm. Um, and it's something that we're really excited about. From an investor point of view, obviously I'm, I'm looking at it because oh, this is fantastic. You know, the very first question you, everyone asks is what, what, what's, what's your competition, right? Where, um, who, who, or, and also what's your competition and you know, what is the potential, you know, to mirror somebody who's already in the market? Yeah, I mean, there's no uh, two ways about it. Obviously, we're competing with multinational companies. So um, there's a number of different DICOM viewers in the market. So DICOM is the um, kind of standard file type that's exported from CT, MRI and PET scanners globally. And it's one of the things that's allowed Singular Health to be who we are today. This standardization of the file means that you don't have to create different software or different protocols every time you go and use a different scanner. You know, we can load up CT scans of people's knees from, you know, Mexico or an MRI scan of a brain from Melbourne. It doesn't really matter. It all works off this DICOM scan. So there's these things called DICOM viewers that have been around for years. It's basically the standard um, radiological software. And we've certainly, you know, done our competitive analysis, made sure that we, you know, at least mirror the, the components that they have in their software, but bring our advanced 3D visualization. So in terms of competitiveness with the DICOM viewer, um, from a technical perspective, we're now on par. And that's, you know, um, thanks to our excellent technical team. I mean, they've worked really hard over the last couple of years to really bring the software up to scratch with you know s companies that have been around for 10 15 years as well as doing the 3d and the vr um and in terms of marketing and, and competition um i mean we ranked number two on google for three dicom viewer for 3d dicom viewer so we've gone through a process of search engine optimization for the dicom viewer component for the, the scan viewing um, and yeah, we work on both Windows and Mac, whereas a lot of the existing competition only works on Mac or Windows. They don't work across both. So the fact that we're cross-platform really has given us an advantage in that space. When you get to the scan to surgery and the AI components and the 3D printing, of course, there's large multinationals out there. Um, our biggest competitor, I'd say, is probably a company called Materialize. Um, they're listed on the NASDAQ from memory, um, around about like a 2.6 billion US dollar market cap, global reach. Um, but, you know, I'd like to have a competitor like that and, you know, comparison like that. And they're, they're really, um, there's almost like a bit of a playbook that you can leverage. Um, but we're, we're not a me too product. We don't want to just copy what they've done. We want to bring out you know, we want to lead the pack in terms of the virtual reality. And I think, you know, moving to these standalone VR headsets, putting the, the power back into the hands of the surgeons as well, and having almost a glo like globalization mixed with localization in that our software is globally accessible, but the manufacturer can be localized. So you can have a surgeon in Lyon in France who downloads our software um, with the you know, correct approvals, et cetera, will be able to go through and segment the patient's anatomy, do their preoperative planning and get it 3D printed in Italy or get it printed in France, not all the way over in Melbourne, Australia. So it's a global software application 
with the ability to leverage local infrastructure um, and the 3D printing bureaus, you know, as a um, distribution or go-to-market strategy actually can act as, as distributors or resellers for us because it will lead, lend to more work for them as well. So um, it's, it is a competitive space. Uh, we have large competitors, but I think what we've done on the budget that we have and the strides we've made to not just catch up but surpass some of these companies in, in different areas, um, you know, I, I think it's, um, I'm pretty competitive and, and I think that we're um, kind of midfield at the moment, but making good strides to get to the front of the pack. I also noticed a while ago, oh, I think you maybe in, in the last quarter, you made an announcement of relationship with Osteopore. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, so, I mean, we, um, in terms of developing our IP and, and where we take the company, it's not all about doing in-house. You know, there are places where there's natural fits or um, the ability to partner and collaborate with, with various organisations and, and other ASX-listed companies. Osteopore is one of those companies, um, and it really is coming off the back of a CSIRO Kickstart grant. So we did the CSIRO Kickstart 1 project. We were able to uh, work with CS CSIRO's Data61 team to segment the spine, so every single vertebrae can be segmented out of a CT scan. Um, like identified, it tells you which vertebrae it is, it then gives you the height, it extracts it using an AI model in, in only a couple of minutes with 95.2% accuracy or thereabouts. And so as we looked into doing our second Kickstart 2 project with CSIRO, we were really looking at you know a fit that would allow us to improve our software, um, integrate another AI model, but also collaborate with, with another company. And so we identified cranial implants as a, a really interesting fit. And of course, you know, there's almost no one better than Osteopore in terms of the cranial implant space. Um, they're bioresolvable lattice, so they actually 3D print a lattice that allows the bone to regrow back into that space. And then once the bone's regrown into the space, the lattice pretty much like dissolves into the bone. So you're not putting a titanium implant into somebody's head, you're putting this soft lattice to begin with the bone regrows over a period of you know months or years, and then you're left with natural bone back in its, its place. So it's really cutting edge stuff. And where we see ourselves fitting in with the Kickstart 2 and why we're collaborating with Osteopore is that um, we're providing the software um, and the AI model that the AI model will be integrated into. And you'll be able to have a, a CT scan of like a traumatic head injury. So somebody falls off their bike or crashes their motorbike and, you know, um, a part of their skull has to be removed to, you know, um, reduce pressure on the brain. Um, and that part obviously needs to be replaced. And as I said earlier, there's like 1.1 million cranial uh, surgeries done per year. So a massive market. When you do the CT scan of the, the preoperative um, plan, you can effectively cut out the area that needs to be removed or the area that's now missing. And the AI model will actually design, automatically design a new cranial implant. That will then be verified by the surgeon and then it can be 3D printed using Osteopore's 3D printed bio lattice and implanted into the patient. And it's, again, all about accelerating that process so that from the, the scan to when they do the surgery can be a matter of, you know, hours rather than a matter of days. So just with that example alone, I mean, I'm just trying to... I thought I had an idea of what you guys... Um, your the, the, the business model. But so they're using your AI. Is that correct? Uh, they will. So we've entered into this agreement... Um, to work together through the CSIRO Kickstart 2. Okay. It's roughly, I believe, about a nine-month process, um, so project, um, whereby we've procured the training data set uh, for CSIRO, but um, Osteopore will be working with us on 
providing some real life examples of craniotomies, you know, where they've removed part of the cranium um, for this AI model to be tested on. Um, and then uh, once we have the results from CSIRO, if they're positive, uh, which, you know, they will. we hope they are. <laughs> um, and, you know, they did a brilliant job in the first project. Um, we will then look to integrate that into our software. Okay. And then Osteopore um, and Singular Health will most likely, or the intention is for us to participate on in a trial um, of the software in an actual clinical environment after the project comes to a close. So the software we're talking about, your software, your AI, your technology is not, common common thing out in the market space no it, there's many different disparate softwares for doing particular you know clinical designs or you know um, orthognathic surgery or replacement of ribs yep. etc but there's not really a you know standardized piece of software um, or platform um, that enables you know, surgeons from different specialties to, to kind of plan these um, patient-specific surgeries. I asked that question because I'm sitting here thinking, well, that's a fairly simple process, what you described. I understand that it's very complicated, but the process, and I'm thinking, oh, so they must, the, the, the software that you have, it must not be in a, out there commonly. Uh, it's kind of manually designed at the moment. Okay. But, um, okay. Well, it's yours would be sort of, Automated uh, or semi-automated, you know, it's, it's about um, accelerating these manual processes. Okay. So obviously we've got you know a growing population, a aging population, you know, more and more surgeries per year, um, and if you can optimize and accelerate these you know surgical planning um, processes with our software, and then just have the verification at the end and the surgical plan and everything created. Um, it, it's about improving the efficiency in, in the hospital and private clinic. Uh, okay, okay. Um, now we talked about competitors, we talked about your sort of potentials and stuff. Yep. I'm keen to see, to, to get your thoughts on where do you see this market going? Because um, I'm thinking that, you know, everything is patient specific in some yep. sense. And if we can increase, make it the process more efficient, Somewhere along the line, the cost is going to be, well, the cost of doing the whole process in the old ways would have been X, Y, Z dollars. Yep. And because it's more efficient, it per item may be the same price, and but the actual total cost for the patient would be lower because time less spent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yep. What is your, my, my narrative is that. So what, in your opinion, obviously you guys are industry, mm. how far am I off the mark or am I on the mark? No, I mean, you're completely on the mark. So there's been studies done in the US that have looked at off-the-shelf components in patients as opposed to patient-specific implants. At present, the actual surgery with a patient-specific implant is a bit more expensive because, of course, you're printing these biomodels, you're printing titanium cutting guides and titanium implants and um, extra components that they don't really use at the moment, so you've got guided surgery and you've got patient-specific component surgery. Um, guided surgery uses typically off-the-shelf components and patient-specific surgery has the cutting guides and the, the drill guides, etc. However, in the 12 to 18 months after the surgery, when you look at the costs of total recovery time, rehabilitation, the time spent in hospital, etc., it's, it's been shown in limited studies that patient-specific implants actually have uh, a, you know, a, a cheaper overall. And I think, as I said earlier, you know, with 3D printing becoming more prevalent and cheaper, I think we are going to see the cost of those additional components come down. Um, where I see the market going um, is a process of consolidation. So with a few changes to the FDA regulations and the European medical device registration regulations, um, the market is now starting to favour companies that are a little bit bigger. Um, but through, um, but it will also lead to a roll up of all of those smaller companies. So I think okay. there'll be a, a really interesting period of consolidation in the market 
um, and a period of consolidation that we'd like to, you know, take part in, um, and and that will be a, you know, emerging trend over the next couple of years. I think we'll see a lot of smaller companies be acquired by the larger companies, um, and that that works in both ways for us. Um, mm. You know, at looking at potential M and A activity. I mean, that's not new, right? Microsoft was a master of that. Yeah. And our friend um, Facebook is a master of that, and Mr. Google as well. Oh, Facebook managed to pick up Oculus as well to, to roll into their metaverse. So, yeah, um, yeah it, it'll be a really interesting uh, Yeah, I think so. I think ahead. it's a very exciting time. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's how we lead to efficiency. Yeah. It's, it's this kind of stuff. But look, James, it's, a, it's a definitely um, very different. Well, in some ways it's different, in some ways it's not from, from where we, we had the first conversation yeah. in December last year. It's right? an evolution. It's an yeah. evolution. And, and in some parts, the ma major what we just discussed is still the same. It's just in a different form. Right? You yeah. still need to visualize in 3D. And, 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 and I think that, that that is still a major component. Without that part, Correct, yeah. you can't do the rest. Right? Yeah. Um, but look, James, thank you for your, um, for your time. Um, as I always say, you know, any last words for guys? Any any special Samsung hints for investors out there? Um, it's it's an exciting time ahead um, for the software and for the company as a whole. Uh, I think we're in a you know um, really exciting market sector, a growing market sector. Um, the kind of um, macro macro trends are there. Um, that the team is really solid at the moment, and um, you know we've got the GeoVR product as well um, that was mentioned in the prospectus, uh, which is progressing well, um, and also our uh, other products such as the the um, virtual anatomy product as well, um, which uh, you know continues to progress. So so multiple different avenues that we're going down, and uh, really exciting times ahead. So uh, thanks for having us. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Look, I, I I like the story. I think it's um, it's it's a good good kind of product that's uh, diff slightly different to to what's out there in the world. And you're in the medical field, but you're not sort of biotech, but still on the IT medical IT. I guess you could yeah. call it so. But James, thank you, and uh, I hope we can continue the journey to to, to get in on the story. But uh, again, thank you for yeah. Look coming. forward to uh, another interview yep. soon.